Just 20 years ago, it was a cow paddock, but it grew and kept on growing until April 18, when Geelong and Fitzroy paid the inaugural match at BFL Park. People complained bitterly that money was being wasted on a stadium out in the sticks. But on this day, more than 25,000 fans made the trip to Waverley to see the opening. Although Geelong beat Fitzroy by 61 points, the real winner was the vast new complex. He's already kicked one goal this quarter, and this one's right through the middle, and it's another goal. A fortnight after the great stadium was opened, another giant of the game bowed out. Despite the smiles, it was a bitterly sad day for Ted Whitten as he donned that famed number three Guernsey for the 321st and last time. For 20 years, he was regarded as the most complete player the game had seen. We are do or die effort. It's going to be a determined thing. You've got to show me all the guts and all the determination you've got in your body. You've got to inspire me with this last quarter bit. You've been in front all day and you've got to stay there. Are you going to sit there? His players responded to the call and went on to give Footscray's most beloved son a farewell to remember with a three-point win over Hawthorne at the Western Oval. The king of the western suburbs, Mr. Football, had abdicated. A new champion was taking centre stage in 1970. He hailed from Perth and North Melbourne had to sign a $75,000 bond before they gained his services. The Ruse had a miserable year, but Barry Cable was the club's best player. One up to the half forward flank, Grimm that comes right out from goal. And Tribunals were held at Harrison House in those days, but the guest list had a familiar ring to it. Big Carl got off this time. On the receiving end was Hawthorne's Neil Ferguson. Geelong's Doug Wade got a nudge in the stomach from Footscray's Ken Greenwood. And two weeks for slapping his face. And then it was Big Carl yet again. He got four weeks for biffing the hapless Greenwood. Dittridge made a third appearance that year and got two weeks for using abusive language. For the first time in league history, three full forwards topped the century mark in the one season. A sparse crowd saw Peter Hudson bring up his third hundred on July 18. He kicked 11 goals against Footscray at BFL Park and was to go on and kick 146 goals for the season in a team that finished in 8th position. Meanwhile at Victoria Park, Peter McKinna was having a field day against Carlton. And how that huge crowd loved it. McKinna had kicked 97 goals in 1969, but this day against the Blues, he was in superb touch. He kicks it high into the goal square. They fly down to the ground it comes. With this goal, he brought up his century, becoming the first Collingwood player to do so since Ron Todd in 1939. McKenna went on to kick a club record of 143 goals for the season. And on the eve of the finals, it was Jezelenko's turn. Alex Jezelenko became the first Carlton player ever to reach the 100 goal mark. He was in fine form this day against Melbourne on the MCG, a ground on which he was to dominate in a most memorable September. South's Peter Bedford won the Brownlow medal from Gary Dempsey, Jezza and the newcomer Barry Cable. And for the first time, the count was televised live on Channel 7. Early in September, however, all eyes were on Norm Smith Swans in the first semi-final against St Kilda. South had made the finals for the first time since 1945 in the infamous Bloodbath Grand Final. Bedford shone in a year that saw Des Tudnam and Len Thompson go on strike at Collingwood over match payments. Both were to get $7,000 contracts, but it cost Tuddy the leadership. There were players' strikes at Essendon. The Queen unfurled Richmond's premiership pennant and saw her first Australian football match. And Fitzroy crossed the error and settled at the Junction Oval. For South, this match gave them just a taste of finals football. It was a year memorable for these great marks. Over the back, Roger Dean, a bit over the Lambert. Lambert kick goes into the centre of the ground. Oh, Mark! Terrific, Mark. He's playing well. Oh, Day, a good kick to the wing position on the outer side. Ha, ha, ha! The old cowboy. What a... Wait the time on. The kick taken by Ronaldson. It's a long one to the edge of the goal square. Up they go. Scarlet! Oh, a beauty! With the ball. His kick now going down forward. They're there. Jessalenko, look at that! Oh, 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 oh. Pennell 
breaks right across that centre wing position up towards Jackson and Lewis. Oh, Jackson and Lewis all the way up. Beautiful. He plays on. He's kicking towards the half forward. Oh, beautiful. Ben Robertson was there to get it. Jessalenko looking for that lead. The kick down. Jessalenko comes and goes up. The ball taken by Crane of Carlton. Crane drives in towards centre half for Jackson. Yes! yes. I didn't think he was going to play it, Mike. He was spot on. Mackay to the wing position on the member stand side. Oh, Let's oh, enjoy oh, this mark of Alex Jezelenko's again. It was the mark of the year in 1970 and one of the marks of the 70s. Kid Hopkins had been assigned a bit part in the 1970 Grand Final. He ended up taking star billing in front of a record crowd of 121,000 people. In one of the greatest fightbacks in BFL history, Carlton recovered from a 44-point deficit at half-time against Collingwood to snatch the game. Hopkins had been a reserve, but at half-time he was thrown into the fray. He kicked four goals, wrote his name into the game's history, and was hardly heard of again. Fate had robbed Bobby Rose and the Magpies yet again. For the mastermind, Carlton coach Ron Barassi, it was to be a move that has made his name legend in coaching. A lot of people think that Carlton's revival began with that second half. Uh, Nick and the players, and we all agreed that we, we felt just in the last five or six minutes of the first half, we were starting to get more of the ball. It wasn't showing so much on the scoreboard, because we had such a leeway to make up. But it really started at half-time when Brass, uh, amongst other things, just... Uh, you know, sort of rammed into us, just play on handball, like, you know, no, we can't be any worse, we've just got to try something, and that's really when it started, you know, plus Teddy Hopkins. We seem to panic a little bit, and looking at the replays over the years, I've noticed that many of our players flew together and spoiled each other, and the ball came to the ground, and this uh, suited the style of game that you were playing at that time, that's with the right. handball. <laughs> The 1971 season opened sensationally at Arden Street when reigning premiers Carlton were toppled by the 1970 Wooden Spooners, North Melbourne. But it was slamming Sam's day. North's dynamic forward Sam Kekovic tore Barassi's blues to shreds. It wasn't the first time these two headstrong men had crossed paths and as the 70s unfolded, it wasn't to be the last time. To add to Barassi's worries at this time was a wrangle he had had with Adrian Gallagher's fiance who claimed that Barassi treated his men like little boys. While Kekovic could be brilliant, he was like a stick of dynamite with a short fuse. Just one week later, he exploded. After this tangle with St Kilda's Barry Breen, he was suspended for two matches. In one of the most publicised swaps in football history, Richmond swapped Billy Barrett for St Kilda's captain Ian Stewart. And with play like this, Stewart sparked the Tigers. It was a magnificent year for the recruiters. The names of Jeff Southby, David Clark, Michael Tuck, Gary Wilson and Brian Roberts appeared for the first time. North Keith Gregg was the recruit of the year and he took no time to prove it. He made the state team after his eighth game. And then along came Diamond Jim. Melbourne yeah, spent $39,000 and months negotiating with South Australian club Sturt before John Tilbrook made his debut in June. Well, there's a good shot of him. Getting a great cheer. He's paid off his first dollar. Oh, and he's kicked the thing about 150 yards. Two bounces to put him in. Over at the junction oval, Peter McKenna brought up his second successive hundred with this goal against Fitzroy. Well played and then he had to put up with the consequences. McKenna ended the season with 134 goals and a reputation as a singer. His record of things to remember sold 7,000 copies. Here they come. Here they come. The kids are coming on the ground now. McKenna has kicked his 100th goal. At Glenferry Oval on July 24 against Footscray, Peter Hudson calmly notched his fourth successive century. He just kept kicking goal after goal. 
to Wilson, his third goal for the game, but more importantly, his 100th goal for the season, kicked at the 19 minute mark of the third quarter, down here at Glenfrey Oval, it's Hawthorne playing for Australia. 1971 was a hard bruising year, Russell Crowe and Eric Leach. Jeff Blethen collected Dennis Clark. St Kilda's Jimmy O'Day. Stephen Theodore collided with Barry Davis. St Kilda's Alan Davis. Kevin Sheedy and Peter Crimmins. Norm Bussell gave Bruce Sherpig a cuddle. Peter Hudson got the ball and a pat on the back from Jeff Strang. Ray Bithen and Doug Wade tangled. The earth shook when John Nichols went down. Sherpig again, this time as he ran into Ian Collins of Carlton. Richmond's Graham Bond. And the most famous of them all, Barry Cable bumped into Lee Matthews, and it took years for the hostility between Western Australia and Victoria to simmer. In September, Ian Stewart won the Brownlow medal for the third time, becoming the only man in league history to win the award with different clubs. And we farewelled three champions, South's Bobby Skilton, Carlton's Sergio Silvani, and Geelong's Billy Goggin. Among the great marks of the season were these, Melbourne's Gary Hardiman and that high-flying hawk, Peter Knights. On grand final day, every eye was on Peter Hudson as the Hawks lined up against St Kilda. It was to be the hardest grand final of the decade, as two sides who depended almost totally on physical toughness met head-on. For Hudson, it could have been the highlight of his football career. He needed only four goals to topple Bob Pratt's record of 150 goals in a VFL season. It was a sad year. The football world mourned the passing of its leader. Sir Kenneth Luke, the president of the VFL, died in June. He left the giant stadium at Waverley as a monument to his vision. Carlton had missed out on the finals, and coach Ron Barassi decided to call it a day. He said he was tired of football and wanted a break. And Collingwood's Bob Rose ended his years of heartbreak by retiring. He'd taken the Magpies into the finals for the seventh time in eight years, for the inglorious record of three wins from 13 games. North Melbourne started its climb from the depths. Under new president Alan Aylett, the Roos finished ninth. St Kilda signed a promising young ruckman from Western Australia called Graham Moss. And Norm Smith retired as coach of South bringing down the curtain on an illustrious career that had spanned four decades and included nine premierships with Melbourne. In the end, there were just John Kennedy's Hawks and Alan Jean Saints and Peter Hudson trying for that elusive record. The ball knocked away. Looks like Murray's in a bit of trouble. They go through it on the outer side. Kicks in the woods and a half forward. Plenty of opposition there. Oh, John Bercy pointed out it isn't pretty football, but oh, 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 oh. look, the ball's at centre half forward. Green comes in. Almost unloaded by Bassett. Oh, they fly. It's Becker almost takes them out. But Dickerson. Oh. The ball on. Rice is there. Angus will shift the frame, but oh, Neil bowls him over, who's come right into the game in this third quarter. Gets it up the left hand half forward. It's Wilson, a desperate tackle. Makes him unload the ball quickly. Take it Oh, what a shot. Let's hear from Jack Edwards. There's the kick. Murray coming out this time. Injury's been occurred now for two or three minutes, and it looks too bad for him to continue. Right down toward the half forward flank with Heath does a, a diving mark, and it's paid. Picks up after the half back flank, they set themselves. Up they go, and there's a good mark. Scott comes around on his left foot, goes to a half forward flank. Up they go. Oh, beautiful mark. And Moore, and Moore drives the ball around the wing. Over to oh, the oh, back from Moran. A great mark. Beautiful. Moore now, up towards centre half forward. Hudson moves in, goes up. Oh, he's marked. Hudson is marked. Kick forward. Take Hudson had three. plenty of chances, but none as easy as this shot in the dying minutes of the game. He steadies. He kicks. God, he's missed it. Oh, he missed the goal and Pratt's record. He's put it out of bounds on the fourth. Goes straight up the ground. Players move into it there. Pushed across to Judson. Judson surrounded by Hawthorne players, but he'll get a free kick. Hard way to get it, but he's got the free kick. 
Judson. Time running out for the Saints. It's a long quarter, this one. Judson takes his kick. Goes to the flank position on the outer side. The sun comes out as the ball hits the ground and Heath sends it back to the wing position. And then there were just the victorious Hawks. So in goes Hawthorne, our premiers, 1971. Hawthorne, our premiers, and the final scoreboard here reads, let's have a look at it, as John Kennedy is being hugged and congratulated. And the final scoreboard, Hawthorne, 12, 10, 82, St Kilda, 11, 9, 75. We were quite confident we could win it because the second semi-final was, um, you know, was a... Um, Hawthorne got away from us and then we ran them down and, um, and we played exceptionally well to, in, the, in the final game against Richmond to get back out and have another go again and uh, oh, we were quite keen. I remember thinking at three quarter time when uh, going out when Alan's team were about three or four goals in front I thought well you know what a rotten thing to happen to us. We've, been, we've won 19 matches, we've, uh, we fell in in the semi-final and is this going to be the day when we lose but I think I think the players thought that too. They must have thought, been thinking the same thing and they dragged a little bit more out in the last quarter. I remember John saying, well, it's a grand final, we've worked this hard for this long, that we ought, if we're going to go down, we ought to go down with a bang. And he was talking in the sense that we might lose the thing. And I remember Scotty, uh, you know, I was captain of the sky, but Scotty uh, brought the blacks together again, or so they grouped up again, they went away, and he said, what's he talking about losing? He said, we'll win it. And I think Scott set the patterns as um, Alan has already mentioned from the centre bounces. And... Peter Hudson started 1972 in sensational style. Playing against Melbourne at the Glen Ferry Oval, the Hawks champion Spearhead had kicked eight goals late in the second term. He may have failed by just one goal to eclipse Pat's record in the 1971 Grand Final, but against the Demons, he was in magnificent form. Because at this stage, the Hawks not firing, but uh, certainly doing enough to keep Melbourne out of it. Up they go, Kenner with the running, but Scott still manages to get the knock towards Kenner. Then, he puts the ball up towards the half forward bank. Hudson's there and takes him out. Four against running, but he's still beaten. Slung to the ground by Melbourne yeah, defender Barry Burke, now, uh, Hudson's knee Kenny twisted Kenny under him. His Drop agony was felt foot. by every Hudson spectator. It was to ground him for nearly 22 months, and the reigning Premier faded into obscurity without him. He's in pain, real pain. Two points have been Tottenham. Tottenham is skipper, skipper. Looks to goals and there's another on the board. And at Windy Hill, Des Tottenham took over as captain coach of Essendon but, uh, and immediately made his mark after turbulent years with Collingwood. The side that finished 11th the, the previous two years responded to Tuddy's uh, iron discipline and fearless leadership. They won the first four matches of the year and were destined for a place in the final. He instilled a toughness in them that occasionally came to the point, like this day at the MCG against Melbourne. There were no reports from this brawl. The odd broken nose and Rip Guernsey provided the only aftermath. For the VFL Tribunal, it was a hectic year. They heard 30 reports. Gallagher chips in, takes it away from all of them. Under captain coach John Nichols, Carlton was emerging as the premiership threat. They had good luck recruiting and finally wooed Greg Kennedy from Eagle Hawk to Prince's Park. Kennedy kicked a club record of 12 goals against Hawthorne this day and marked himself as one of the top finds of the season. He was to go on and kick 76 goals for the season, trailing Peter McKenna, Essendon's centurion Jeff Blethen and Doug Wade in the goal kicking. Among other recruits to show out in 72 were John Henry at Hawthorne, South Norm Goss, Richmond Wingman, Brian Wood and North forward Arnold Brightis. Kennedy coming in, 
With play like this, Len Thompson won the Brownlow Medal at a canter, becoming the first magpie for 32 years to take football's highest individual honour. Within months, Thompson had gone into retirement after calling for a pay rise. The final series underwent a facelift with the introduction of the final five and for the first time the finals were played at both the AFL Park and the MCG. St Kilda won the last three games before the finals including a thriller at Glen Ferry Oval to keep Hawthorne out of the five. And then in the elimination final at Waverley the Saints demolished Essendon by 53 points before a crowd of more than 52,000. Not even the rugged example set by Tuddenham could inspire the Bombers that day. Players coming in a little bit excited, but Pitt Tottenham taking the magnificent mark there, running back at it. Oh, half time, fairly close. The Tottenham comes in and puts it right through the middle. Richmond went into the second semi-final against Carlton, having won the previous four encounters. The Blues led by 13 points at the beginning of the last term, but as Alex Jezelenko marked, the siren sounded with scores level. The siren! The siren has sounded! It's a draw! Carlton and Richmond have drawn on 8 goals, 13, 61 points. So next week, the kick from Jezelenko after the siren won't score! And it's a draw. It was the fifth finals tie in BFL history and shocked the experts who had installed Richmond as the hottest premiership favourites in years. For field umpire Ian Coates, the action was only over momentarily. As he walked from the ground, he was attacked from behind by an enraged spectator. I didn't see what happened. It was a nasty scene. From violence to beauty. These were the mucks. the semi-final replay easily before 92,000 people at the MCG the following week, while Carlton came into the grand final the hard way, eliminating St Kilda in the preliminary final. It was the grand final that rewrote the record books. It had everything. Hard clashes. Long run, up to the pocket, David McKay on his own. Tong. Plays down the other end. Bank on the other side of the ground. Sheedy and Dool doing battle. Oh! Walsh. Walsh of Richmond pushing the ball in front of him. He's got possession. Oh, he's unloaded. Ball to the half forward flank for Carlton on that outer side. And Hunter one-hander. Oh, look at this. It's right down, but it's all in Richmond. Boyle has cuts the ball away from his teammate in Clay. Clay gets a big knock. It goes back to Robert Walls. Walls has his head on it for Goes driving down, looking for John Nichols and Boyd. Brilliant Nichols goals. High, and the big fellas almost take Alex Jezelenko kicked Claire seven goals. Captain but coach John Nichols and Robert Walls, six Here apiece. Goes wide to the flank and he'll find Robert Walls here. Robert Walls has got the run in on Hunt. Runs around everybody there. Comes in now towards goal. Oh. Carlton's winning score of 28-9, 177 was the highest grand Here final score ever. Richmond's 22-18-150 would have won the Tigers the flag in any previous season. It was a real freak sort of a game, particularly by Carlton. I didn't think the scores were any real indication of the play because I thought they had played us, you know, by uh, 
many, many goals. I thought we were struggling all day long, you know, and I know the scoreboard only showed, I think, 27 points at the end of the day, but I, you know, I think that we were probably, say, even a bit blessed to get within that. You know, we just uh, concentrated mainly on, on, on putting our strengths in our forward line, that we had to, you know, just going with one thing, our, our defence, we, we didn't worry as much about our defence, and we just concentrated on trying to kick you know, a bigger school than Richmond, which probably sounds, you know, an old cliche, <laughs> yeah, but that was the style of play, really, in those years. Back towards the centre of the ground, goes Jones. For the newly crowned Premiers, 1972 had a chilling anti-climax at the Australian Team Championships in Adelaide. There, the Blues met one Malcolm Brown. It was a meeting that left an impression on many of them. To make matters worse, Carlton lost the fight to the bulky West Australian and the Championships to North Adelaide. For many Victorians, this telecast from Adelaide gave them their first sight of the outrageous Mr. Brown. Within two years, he was throwing his weight around in the VFL. The NFL introduced the 10-year rule in 1973 and the club sank deeper into debt as they bartered for champions like John Rantel, Barry Davis, Carl Ditterich, Doug Wade, Wee Georgie Bissett and Adrian Gallagher, all suddenly on football's open market. The resurrection of North Melbourne began with the signing of Ron Barassi as coach and a host of star players like Wade, Davis and John Rantel. Barassi wanted experienced men around him and found them in former coaches Norm Smith and Bill Stevens. The man every club chased was former St Kilda captain Carl Ditterich, the big blonde ruckman finally signed with Melbourne in a deal that sent a financial tremble through the foundations of the VFL. Ditterich was cleared in a deal that involved a $62,000 contract, a $20,000 payout to the Saints, plus clearances for Bruce and Robert Elliott. Two days before the season, the football world mourned the passing of John Coleman, a favourite son. In the months to follow, we would mourn the deaths of Norm Smith, Reg Hickey and Marcus Wheeler. It was fitting that the great North Melbourne revival should begin with a narrow victory over Hawthorne at Arden Street. In the years to follow, the Roos under Barassi and the Hawks under Kennedy and later Parkin were to stage some magnificent tussles. Of the veteran recruits, none was more spectacular than Doug Wade, who kicked five goals in his debut with North. It was a season that saw Kevin Murray resume his long career with Fitzroy and a much heralded ruckman named Graham Moss arrived at Essendon from Western Australia. VFL president Sir Morris Nathan took time out at the league dinner to attack players for their lack of loyalty. Ben Thompson collected his Copeland trophy as Collingwood's best player and told the audience he was in retirement. A new and more lucrative contract was all that Tomo needed to get back into the action. Hawthorne kicked a record against Essendon at VFL Park thanks to an 11-goal spree by rover Lee Matthews. Then on May 15, the VFL decided to end the fiasco caused by the 10-year rule, and it was rescinded. He's got two opponents, two opponents, and keeps Greg from North. Wins out on the day. Greg now a long kick down forward. It's a float. Oh, it's bad spin. Interstate football was introduced to VFL Park on June 2nd and Victoria, led by Barry Davis, thrashed Western Australia by 88 points. Davis was the first North Melbourne player to captain the state team since Charlie Gordian in 1936. Among the stars for Victoria that day were Len Thompson, David Clark, Pete Craig and of course Alex Jezelenko. It was a hectic year for tribunals at the VFL's new city headquarters in Jollimont. Fitzroy's Barry Padley and South Melbourne's John Petura slug it out. They were both reported and each was suspended for two matches. <laughs> Richmond's Wayne Walsh and Essendon's Pat Wellington each paid a two-week penalty after this dust-up. This brawl at Moorabbin was responsible for the introduction of televised evidence at VFL tribunals. Not that it did Ian George of St Kilda much good. George, number 46, was reported for striking Melbourne's Dennis Clark, was found guilty and suspended for two weeks.
Richmond's Francis Burke got a biff from Sam Kekovich, but the north forward was found not guilty. Believe it or not, Jeff Clifton of Collingwood was reported in this incident with Sid Jackson. Jackson wasn't reported and Clifton wasn't suspended. Wayne Richardson was in the firing line and sure enough got cleaned up by Carlton's Vin Waite. Waite was found not guilty of charging, but did get a little of his own medicine back from Ross Dunn. There was jubilation at South Melbourne after the Swans beat Geelong. It was South's first win for the season. In fact, it was the first time the Swans had won in 29 matches. If there was a highlight for the year, you couldn't go past the return of Peter Hudson. Overweight, tentative, and with a question mark over his fitness, Hudson mesmerised the Collingwood defence with the same ease he had shown nearly two years before. He flew from Tasmania, caught a helicopter to VFL Park, and at 27 years of age, picked up the threads of his football career. He kicked eight goals, gave his own press conference after the game, and went home to Tasmania. It was to be another two years before he returned. Dunn and Hudson there. Hudson, that's gone out. And it was a forward line. Where was Hudson at the back? Dunn in front. Hudson, who just that ball to fix it. Can't read the game in front. Kicking to the Wellington Road end. Hawthorne need this one. He kicks and he's put it through. That's a Robert Wolf. North Melbourne under Barassi lifted from last to sixth in 1973 and narrowly missed a finals berth. There was one compensation. A shy blonde wingman named Keith Gregg astounded nearly everyone by polling 27 votes to win the Brownlow medal by two votes from Graham Moss. Gregg became the first North player to win the medal. Just four weeks after celebrating his win at the Southern Cross, Gregg came fifth in North's best and fairest behind imports Barry Davis and John Rantel. There was the grace of Keith Gregg, and there were marks like these in 1973. For the second year in a row, Richmond and Carlton battled it out for the flag. Collingwood had ended the year on top of the ladder, winning 19 of the 22 matches. But when it came to the finals, they lost both matches without uttering a squeak. Carlton, under captain coach John Nichols, had beaten Richmond twice in the matches leading up to the grand final and went into the match as slight favourites. It was to be remembered as the most cold-blooded grand final of the decade. Not since 1945 and the bloodbath grand final of South and Carlton had a match created such controversy. There was brilliant football. Playing a high one over the centre, up goes Mackay, Burt was in there, a chance here for Jesselenko, Jesselenko punched it into a handy position for David Dixon, Dixon's kick it through, Nichols is there. Laurie Fowler flattened Big Nick. Sheedy Pennell's after him, now breaks away with the ball, he's grabbed it in high, he's getting the free kick. And then along came Neil Baum, and he sorted out Carlton's chances once and for all. Pushed away by White and Southgate, and Southgate is over too high. He's up in front, gets it down, it's taken by Baum, his kick smothered. Coming up, oh! 
There were some wonderful marks. In the end, the Tigers stood supreme, victors by five goals. Uh, I think that uh, 1972's loss was one of the real driving forces be behind our 73 win for a start. I can remember after the game, Paul Sproul saying to me, who incidentally played a fantastic game in 73, said to me, you had your easiest day of your life today. He said there was no known way our players were going to get beaten today. That's the way he felt after the game. This is that particular day, uh, Fowler gave me a hard knock in the first quarter early and whilst I felt I was all right you know I know now looking back on it afterwards and after the game that I probably didn't have a good enough liaison between you know being the general on the field and my non-playing members off the field and uh, uh, I didn't realize at the time and they didn't realize that I'd been probably stunned as much as I was but I felt that the biggest thing in 73 was the loss of Keo and Armstrong before I started and I think as results proved it afterwards that uh, you know, our roving division that year uh, was, uh, was really horrible on the day. again dominated headlines as the 1974 season approached. From Woodville in South Australia, they secured a high flyer named Malcolm Blight. He won the McGarry Medal in 1972, but was destined to reach even greater heights. And at the top of Ron Barassi's shopping list was the little master, 31-year-old Barry Cable. And Caves couldn't get here quickly enough. Richmond cast its net in Perth and landed the incredible Mal Brown. Explosive, outspoken and an inspirational leader, Brown just couldn't wait to take up where he left off with John Nichols and his Blues. For Big Nick, it was to be his last season. On May 4th, he played his 322nd game, breaking Ted Whitten's league record. He would continue playing for another nine games before announcing his retirement. He left an impressive record, 31 state matches, premiership honours in 1968, 1970 and 1972. A record, five club best and fairests, and with Polly Farmer, the title of the greatest ruckman the game has seen. The most shameful spectacle of the decade took place at Windy Hill on May 18, and the repercussions were still being felt in the courts months later. It was a brawl that left a sour taste in everyone's mouths. In American sitting of the VFL Tribunal, Mal Brown was suspended for one match for assault. Richmond Stephen Parsons was suspended for four matches. Ron Andrews received six matches. Essendon physical education instructor Jim Bradley got six matches. Essendon runner Laurie Ashley got six weeks. And Essendon rover John Casson got off on a striking charge. Such was the fury of the brawl that Richmond's huge ruckman Brian Roberts didn't even think he'd been punched. He thought he'd been kicked in the head by the trooper's horse. Being uh, pushed out of the track now, police trying to break up this very sordid incident at Windy Hill. Mel Brown holding his hands up to the crowd. If that's a gesture of victory, I don't know whether it's good or bad. Cut up considerably before the day On August the 24th, it's Roy's wonderful old warrior, Kevin Murray, played his 333rd VFL game. In his long and distinguished career, Murray had been captain for eight years and was the club's best player a record nine times. And of course in 1969, he became the oldest player to win the Brownlow medal. In a season for milestones, it was Doug Wade's turn on August 31 against Portland. A safe chest mark. 
perfect accuracy and Wade had registered his 1,000th goal. Only Collingwood's Gordon Coventry had kicked more. Kevin Bartlett was hot favourite to take the Brownlow, but on the last third of the night, Keith Gregg bobbed up again to take his second successive medal. The man who wears number 27 for North holds 27 votes both years. It was a year for the veterans, but there were some vintage marks. Brassies Ben from Arden Street were the toast of the town in September as they played in the finals for the first time since 1958. Richmond under Tom Hafey was still the most powerful team in the competition and although North was a sentimental favourite with the crowd on grand final day, the Tigers were the team to beat. The Tigers had lost Mal Brown on the eve of the finals. He'd been reported for the second time in the season and was suspended for four matches. His absence made little difference to Richmond. The Tigers had one of the most complete football sides ever to play and became the first team to win successive flags since Melbourne in 1959-60. Their win crowned a year of nostalgia. We saw John Nichols and Kevin Murray's personal milestones and then their retirements. Essendon's Burley Ruckman Don McKenzie retired after 266 games. Carlton's secretary and 1947 Brownlow medalist Bert Deacon died. The NFL players banded together and formed their own players association. Fitzroy coach Graham Donaldson resigned midway through the season and John Greening made a spectacular comeback to league football against Richmond in June. Hawthorne left Glen Ferry Oval and joined Carlton at Prince's Park and Victoria defeated South Australia at the Sydney Cricket Ground. On September the 28th, it was Richmond's day. There would be others for Ron Barassi and his North Melbourne team. This day belonged to Tom Hafey and the Tigers. Plenty of players there. Who's going to come out with it? Kevin Bartlett. Bartlett puts it over the centre, down the wood, centre half forward. Van Tell of North Melbourne takes a good mark. Van Tell plays on immediately. His kick goes to the half forward flank. Arnold Blyders comes out to meet it. North are going down, fighting. Hand pass over towards Burns. He's in trouble as Clayton comes through. Clayton is tackled. There is Kevin Morris with Burns. A solo goes. And the final scoreboard in the 74 grand final reads. Richmond 18, 20, 128. North Melbourne 13, 9, 87. I felt confident. Uh, you always feel confident, don't you? Uh, I wouldn't say it was a you know, unbelievable, we can't possibly lose sort of you know, super confidence, but sure we were confident. But you know, we, we recognised that we had to play at our top, things had to go right, we had to try and make them go right, and all those sort of things, but uh, uh, you asked the question, yes, sir, we were confident. The club was terribly close, and I do believe that did help. And also, let's face it, North Melbourne at that stage were only on the come on, and they were inexperienced final players, so that probably helped us a little bit as well. If you were going for a, for a two in a row again, uh, would you, in the second year, uh, if you could, and do it surreptitiously, uh, organise something that would bring the players together, like a, well... Uh, like blast the umpires or something like that? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Well, would you? Oh, I think you'd have to. I think it'd probably be, uh, you know... Well, 
We're not going for two in a row, by the way. I'm no, not. I realise that. <laughs> burst onto the BFL scene at the start of 1975 and colour, the missing dimension, came into our homes for the first time. There was Philip Carmen at Collingwood, whose hero status was to turn sour later in the 70s. Carlton paid dearly for Rhodes scholar Mike Fitzpatrick from Western Australia, but due to studies at Oxford, they saw him rarely in those days. And Footscray paid $50,000 for South Australian Neil Saxe. In this incident, Saxe broke his spine and became a quadriplegic. It was the tragedy of the decade. When Essendon met Carlton at BFL Park on Anzac Day, a crowd of 77,770 turned up to see the undefeated teams tangle. It was the biggest crowd ever to see a match at the park, and they weren't disappointed. With Des Tubman leading the charge and young Simon Madden, a 17-year-old schoolboy kicking six goals, Essendon won by 17 points in a match remembered for its ferocity. With a tap back towards Noonan. Noonan breaks clear, steady, he kicks. He when Essendon and Carlton met the second time round, there were some old scores to settle. Field umpire Ian Robinson had his hands full as he sorted this tangle out. In a marathon sitting in the league tribunal, eight players faced 11 charges. Carlton, Rod Ashman and Rod Austin got four weeks. Philip Pennell, two weeks, and David Mackay, a reprimand. Of the Essendon players, Robin Close and Laurie Maloney got two weeks, with Ron Andrews and Neville Fields cleared. In the second encounter for the year, Carlton won the fight and the match by 80 points. The Blues kicked a record 14-1 in the second quarter and still had time to brawl. Meanwhile at Moravan, Bill Carman had undergone a major change. He clipped on a pair of gleaming white boots and kicked 11 goals in an awesome display of sheer ability. From that day on, he was tagged Fabulous Phil. Up they go, Carman's got it again. He fires. Another goal. With Carman in magnificent touch all season, it was difficult to believe that the Magpies had to battle to get into the finals. They beat Melbourne by one point in the last game to secure fifth place, but were bundled up by Richmond the very next week in the elimination final. Earlier in the season, Peter McKenna had retired after having part of his kidney removed. He'd played 182 games and kicked 837 goals. He'd topped the ton three times. It was a season of change. The VFL launched its properties division. After a protracted battle, John Petura was cleared to Richmond. In exchange, South Melbourne received the clearances of Brian Roberts, Graham Teasdale and Francis Jackson. Gary Dempsey was only 20 in 1968 when bushfires swept across his parents' property at Truganini. Trapped by the flames, he received first-degree burns to the arms, back and legs as he ran for cover. There were fears that his career in league football was over. That same lad came back to be the most outstanding ruckman of the 70s. And in 1975, he proved just that by winning the Brownlow medal by one vote from Stan Alves and two votes from Graham Moss. As his name was announced, the big fellow shed a tear and nobody in the room or watching it at home cared one little bit. 1975 Brownlow medal to Gary Dempsey. It was a magnificent year for the High Flyers and these were the marks of 1975.
For the second year in a row, North Melbourne under Barassi was in the grand final, but this time their opponents would be Hawthorne. Since their admission to the BFL together in 1925, the two former association teams had never fought out a league grand final. Hawthorne had won two premierships, but North had always retained that Cinderella image. On September 27, at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, before 110,551 avid fans, North Melbourne changed all that. In a one-sided match, North steamrolled the Hawks by 55 points to bring glory to Arden Street at last. Their win capped a year that saw tragedy and controversy. Neil Saxey was in the Austin Hospital. Hawthorne's little rover Peter Crimmins was operated on to remove a cancerous growth and resumed training as soon as his health improved. Bob Rose retired as coach of Footscray and Cuddy and Essendon parted company after some torrid public exchanges. On grand final day, however, the only thought was of North Melbourne and its first premiership. For Barry Davis, the man who accepted the premiership cup and held it aloft, it was to be his last game. And Doug Wade bowed out after kicking 1,065 goals in 267 games. There'll be a ball up here, I'd reckon now it's called play on. A Knights, well played, Peter Knights, comes out with the ball, gets it to the half-forward flank on the member stand side, and the mark is being taken to the goal square. At the back as wide as a go, a goal! He's got the game! A goal away! Flank taken by Martello. He gets it over to Leon Rice. Rice into the uh, goal square once again. Moncrief went up high. But look at that. Gumbledon will be awarded the mark. He's got him. He's grabbed him. Umpire says players. Oh, is down. And they're not begging any pardons at the moment as the ball goes back. And a mark to play. Malcolm Blight is now on the back line. Oh! Too high, I'd say. Staying at the back was Cap. He can't get clear. Griggs there backing up well. Look at this fella go now. Griggs went to the centre of attack. He's going to boot the ball long. Up towards Wade. What's going to happen now? The ball's pushed to the ground. Kikovic trying to get clear. Gets a hand pass. Greg has missed it. There's Wade going for a goal. Oh! He's kicked the point. Cowton. Cowton gets it across here to Malcolm Blight. Malcolm Blight gets it down into the forward zone once again. No mark. Chance here for Burns. He's going to be tackled by Welsh. A long hand pass to Arnold Gridus. Gridus steadies. He shoots at the big ones. And there's another one. Now here. This is a pretty long quarter. In they come. It's North Melbourne through Chisnell. Getting that ball to the half forward flank on the northern side of the ground. Trotters out. It. It's a Simon. gone. The man who took the kudos was once again Ron Barassi. He was a proud man as he ran onto the MCG to share his players' joy. At the MCG in the 1975 Grand Final, the final scoreboard reads North Melbourne 19, 8, 122, Hawthorne 9, 13, 67. It was magic, it really was. Um, Has it changed? Oh, well, the first is, you know, the first is something special. Uh, not many people in the modern era can claim that joy. First. Uh, uh, Hawthorne 61, Footscray 54 and St Kilda 66 and North Melbourne 75. Uh, all the other famous clubs had their go a long while ago at the first. Uh, but I can remember going back to the social club afterwards and uh, um, I'd been pleasured in grand finals myself before and I'd been spoiled in that regard. So I, uh, my greatest pleasure that night was watching the old supporters, you know, 50, 60s and 70 year olds uh, just dug down the night. pleasure. Oh, that, those people too, but the, uh, <laughs> they, they were just yes, beside sure. themselves and you know, they, oh, was, they were yeah. saying, no, if I die now, it doesn't matter, sort yeah. of thing. It was ab absolutely magnificent. The way they played and the way they finished, and they had a smell of the first premiership, and I don't think any side would have stopped them uh, when they saw victory in their grasp. And um, that was their first premiership. and. Uh, when you get 18 fellows after the one thing which such an intense desire and coached by Barassi, it's pretty hard to do much about it. And uh, we were whipped. We were whipped and we, and we had to suffer the disgrace of having people around the club say, I don't think Hawthorne tried. But it certainly enabled us to sow a few seeds for the next year. <laughs>
There was no greater admission of the quickening pace of the game than at the beginning of the 1976 season, when the league introduced the two umpire system. Not even the BFL expected the system to slip into gear straight away, but they were hardly prepared for the chaos it was to cause at Arden Street this day. Now it's a free kick up the field apparently, I don't know what it's for. When Harvey Lyons and Kevin Smith stopped supplying the comic relief, North Melbourne and Essendon provided one of the most thrilling games of the year. With Ross Henshaw off the ground injured, and both reserves already in action, North had to show every ounce of brilliance to beat Essendon with only 17 men. Well, let's see whether it would be a bit of a miracle if they can win this a short pass. Well, they're even creating the loose man, North. There's Count breaking clears into attack. He tries a short one and it comes off here. Taken by Counton. He gets it across here towards Tanner. Tanner of North Melbourne, a big kick into the forward zone. Burns from the side. Yes, Burns has taken it. Among the incidents of the year, we saw Barry Lawrence. Brian Douge and Russell Olsen. Ray Byrne. Rod Austin. Big car. And Towns. And Walls. And Olsen. George Young went down. Alan Davis. Slamming Sam and Don Scott mixed it up. Brent Croswell lost his cool with Ian Bremner. Through. Ray Biffin nice. ignored the goal umpire and caught up with Robert Muir. Sid Jackson connected David Dench. Gary Bryson, the cowboy. Laurie Fowler collided with George Young. Wayne Judson went down. Fabulous Phil took on Carlton. The ground. Mike Turner and, and Greg Towns tussled. And Temple Square at Cadillia Park. Takes the Cowboy ball. dished it out to Lee Matthews. Lee Matthews marks the ball. He's staying oh, he's got When St Kilda played here. Essendon, Ken Roberts he's took on Paul Callery. Oh, and Parks took on Muir. Well, Louis picked it. He wouldn't have to be real smart to work it out. Bob had his wrestle and with Muir. going to be some fisty cuffs here before the game's over. Ah, there's a little bit going on there. As we see, uh, Muir and Barn. Muir Hunt goes down. John Petura Hunt ran into Rex Hunt. Tuddy broke his arm in this crash with Mark McClure. Sid Jackson and Terry White of Collingwood. Paul Callery slipped a quiet right into Robert Walls. Oh, Jeff Saru and Alan Mangles marched on the spot. Mike Moncrief was flattened by his own man. And of course, Big Carl was still there doing his bit. Who's going to come out with it here? Could be anybody. Oh, behind play. Look at this. She's on again. By 1976, league football was being played at a sprint. Handball was becoming more prevalent with every match, and it got to the stage where clubs were recording more than 120 hand passes during a game. Off the field, the game was continuing to change. Clubs were battling to win lucrative sponsorship deals, such as Carlton's $135,000 deal over three years with Avco. But it was spent just as quickly. Geelong asked North Melbourne for $10,000 for a 16-year-old school boy named Stephen Easton, who was tied to the Cats. As it turned out, Easton was a bargain. He has matured into a fine player with the rules in the space of four years. There were shots. John Nichols quit as coach of the Blues and was to be replaced on the eve of the season by Ian Thoroughwood. Joyce Hart was dumped as captain of Richmond in favour of Francis Burke. But nothing stopped the game from accelerating. Heads for home now, runs up towards the half-court flank, gets a long hand pass across here towards 
towards Woodward. Woodman gives it back towards Carroll. Here's a shot at goal coming up as Carroll puts it on its way. That's the best passage of play by Melbourne. Nolan again. Moss is at it the was no surprise when Essendon's ruck star and captain Graham Moss pinched the Brownlow medal in 1976 from Hawthorne's Peter Knights. But Moss was to immediately shock Essendon by announcing that he had played his last league game and would be returning to Western Australia. His win climaxed four magnificent years with the Bombers. Some of the finest marks captured by Channel 7 cameras in 1976 were these. The cliche the shout goes on out towards the bowling green side. Players set themselves there. A lovely one-handed mark. Cut. Kicks back towards the centre of the ground. And they come. So oh, that's a great mark to Roberts. Well, it's off the side of the boot slightly. He centred it. McClure got up high and took a good mark. He's had a very good season too, Bob. Yes, well, there's his kick. It's a lovely kick. And oh, the mark of the day. And he gets it out to the attacking side again. Looking for Blight. He's oh, that mark. Have a look at that mark. Max Robertson now kicks to the wing position. Quaid is out. Oh, Keith Craig. Matthew screws it around. Up goes Moncrief. Once again, but Barker. It's in the slot. Oh, Ben oh, Quaid arrives. Right. That oh. turn. This is a chance now for Robert Smith. No. Oh. There's a big kick from Baum up to the centre half four position. Oh, it's not a very good kick. It's dropping short. Players fly. Beautiful mark there to Sarah. Who am I going to play this to? Not the best of kicks from Gig. And it goes to uh, Dempsey. Oh, great okay. mark. Cross and Kilda. Good chance for them towards Elliot. Elliot. Oh, oh lovely mark God. by Elliot. Olsen up towards Jesselenko and uh, Dench. Up they go. Dench trying to knock the ball. To, but out to Jesselenko. A snap for goal. Up towards Fitzpatrick. He's got his hand. Yes. And the mark of the season was this one, taken by Collingwood's Billy Picken. Ball driven down towards the forward pocket. When Hawthorne oh, took the field on grand final day against bitter rivals North Melbourne, one man was missing. The Hawks' former skipper Peter Crimmins was dying of cancer. But every Hawthorne player was determined that it would be Crimmo's day. After a disastrous year in 1975 and the drubbing at the hands of North in the grand final, the Hawks under John Kennedy reversed the tables. It was a match that typified the spirit Kennedy had instilled in the Hawthorne side. It was a rugged encounter with Hawthorne supplying the brawl. They knew they had to stop North's running game with sheer physical pressure. There were claims that Hawthorne lacked skill. Compared with North, they may have been justified. But on grand final day 1976, there could have been no doubt about the Hawks' will to win. As he takes the ball back, he runs again. Another run. And he's driving it up. And they swing away towards Ede. He's on the wing position. Got a clear run on his own. He's got one bounce, two bounces. He'll go for a kick now. Hawks at the moment as the ball goes on. Bremner got a as they go for a goal. Hick running into an open goal. Fires it through. It's through. Beautiful. Hand pass, is it? No, he's gone for a hand pass to Falcon. Now it's a dangerous one. Scott's got his gun for the goals. And it's a goal. Now back as they go now for Rick. Hand pass over to Burns. He's got a straight run for the goals. He fires. And it looks very good. Tremendous. Up it goes now. Ball having a go. There's Lethal Lee going for a shot at goals. He doesn't miss. There. Beautiful goal. The ball taken away by Cable of North Melbourne. He's going through that bit of a run. Cable kicks it over the centre. Up goes Malcolm Blight and takes the mark. Plays on immediately. The side. Hawthorne had led by 10 points at three-quarter time and increased that lead to 30 points when the siren sounded. It was Hawthorne's third premiership, all won under John Kennedy. And we talked about what was said about our team in the 75 grand final. And as one of the ones connected with it, I said I didn't believe what was said, but I could understand it being said because of the way we played. And uh, certain of us who had played badly in that 75 grand final did play extremely well in 76 grand final. And I think they were out to uh, vindicate their own honor, as it were, and make sure that those things that were said about them then would not be said about them again. Hudson flies, oh, 
Straight after the match, the players took the Silver Premiership Cup to the home of their dying teammate. Peter Crimmins might not have played in 1976, but he was an inspiration behind the Hawks' gallant victory. The players will still find it a bit slippery. Here's a chance now for Crimmins. Zone at a mark has been paid to Peter Hudson. We'll wait on the result of this. Punched away by Rollins. Picked up by Crimmins. Crimmins going for the left foot. And there's Hudson all by himself. I one out towards Crimmins and Roden. And Crimmins takes the mark. Plays on straight away. And left foots it for a goal. On September 28th, three days after the grand final, Peter Crimmins lost his fight against cancer.
Channel 7. With the side that we had, we did pretty well to get where we got. And I think that we're probably driven by the players' own motivation as much as anything because of the fact that they wouldn't spoon us the previous year. And I did think that we probably needed a lot of things going for us in the... Oh, you know, I, I just felt that probably we nearly lost the game before it was played by losing Cum, and I thought that he was a very important key man in our side. Uh, I think in uh, 74, well, really, you know, the odds were with Tom's way. And I think in 77, the odds were our way, because I really, what Tom said, he, they did well to get there. And, and looking at, and in finals, you really examine and you, you really, just as a player puts in more, a coach does in the finals. Uh, and I, I go along with Tom. I think they did a tremendous effort to uh, nearly win a premiership. We were close to winning, I suppose, at three-quarter time. You know, and I think that probably a lack of experience by a lot of people around the place probably was an important part of that North Melbourne getting up to draw the match. I can remember I was talking to some player and I looked around and all the staff, the trainers, the committee and everybody were jumping up and patting fellas on the back as though we'd already had it one. And all of a sudden I've, I've had to yell out, you know, more or less, the game's still got 30 minutes to go. And yet, you know, like I didn't even realise it because I was talking to one of the players about something and then looked around, you know, and I really believe... This is three-quarter time. This was a three-quarter time, you know, which is a bad time to be doing that, isn't it? In the really? first grand final. In the first grand final of 77. Yeah. It was a great year for North Melbourne that year. And uh, it was a great year for football, I feel, to, for two grand finals of that nature to, to uh, go around Australia. I really think it, that was the start of, of making the grand final even bigger and get towards a stage where it's Australia's premier sporting event, which you know, it's that close to being. continued at a hectic pace in 1978. North finally secured West Australian Ross Glendinning. He's picked it up St Kilda he's bought Gary Sidebottom. Side Look at that for How was that for South Melbourne paid $70,000 for former Fitzroy captain John Murphy and received instant value. And the Swans cleared this gruntled rover, Norm Goss, to Hawthorne. Umpire says play on. Goss picks up the ball, has a snap towards the goal. Yes, completely unnecessary is being reported. Completely unnecessary. St Kilda had risen from last in 1976 to be in second place after the sixth round. Then they met Essendon at Moravan. It was to be one of the ugliest brawls for years. There were allegations and legal threats. Three players were reported. Only one was suspended. Gary Sidebottom was suspended for four matches for striking Mervyn Nagel. Carl Ditterich, appearing at the tribunal for the 15th time, was found not guilty of striking Simon Madden with both fists to the face. And Doug Booth was found not guilty of striking Max Crow. When Hawthorne's Peter Knights lined up on Essendon's Paul Vanderhaar, the sky was the limit. The two high flyers staged their own aerial duel while the game went on about them. That high-flying Hawk Knights might have just got the edge on the young bomber this day, but the real winners were sitting in comfort in the stands. Look out from fullback. Over it goes. Knights in front of a beautiful mark. Knights in front of Vanderhaar on this occasion. What a. But he's had quite a few kicks himself. Knights goes up uncontested from Vanderhaar. Vanderhaar and uh, Point of Fact got underneath the ball too much. Oh, Stone have got up high. Dunstan back. The Saints were to be humiliated like no other team in league history this day. Putgray in 10th place in the league ladder, who did 33 goals, 15, 213 points. The highest score ever recorded against a side that appeared to have thrown in the towel. He has a look for goal number six. No, he's done it too, don't worry about that. Incredible. 14th mark at MC. Dunstan, tackle too high, breaks it. Lines up for goal number seven. And it is. Temple again in the frame. Got it. Well, I give him a Let's face it. 15 marks. Would have to be his greatest performance ever. Certainly with Footscray. 
He's only missed with one scoring shot. With one shot, rather, one kick. Templeton through. Oh, it's partly smothered. Here's trouble low. Templeton, 14. He started. On the rampage again. Templeton can get the flight. From when the back. Kelvin Templeton marked, the ground was invaded by spectators who thought incorrectly that the final siren had sounded. Even coach Don McKenzie was out there as Templeton lined up for his 15th goal. You know, he missed half a last season through injury. That's right. Sustained in the interstate game. And there's the coach, Don McKenzie. <laughs> He's on the ground. Now, I'm just wondering, Jeff, you know, can he be on the ground? As far as I know, the siren hasn't gone. It hasn't gone yet. And he's kicked it. That's his 15th. They'll have to stop this, uh, the game until they get the fire. There were dramatic well, moments in 1978, the but even the most serious of them well, had a lighter funny, side. Yeah. By Ray Khan. And Khan drives the ball out wide, looking for Turner. Puts it away by Greg, who follows on. Oh! There's Greg. And there would be certainly a great thing for Jezza that's been appointed captain and coach of the side there this week. started bruising. Hawthorne only need one goal to take the game out. Big Carl. And Big Carl handed it out and copped a bit from Neil Baum and a bit more. And very quick to get good to Muir and Greg. And a good safe mark taken by Muir. Uh, just about a, does a chip shot in the air. Cousins and Baum. No, I don't think so, baby. Michael Roach and Gary Bryce. McClure on his mark. Mark McClure didn't see Mick Nolan. Pleasantries, Scott and Ditteridge style. Lee Matthews downed Michael Wright. Peter Knights collided with Craig Stewart. John Murphy went down. Madden stopped Gary Dempsey. Terry Carl hit the deck. So did Norm Goss. John Newman lifted the arm and Dawson went down. Alex Jezelenko didn't see what hit him. A pat on the head from Big Carl. Teammates went down. Bond and Jezza collided. And of course there was Robert Muir and Philip Pennell. Greg Towns. Muir got four weeks for hitting Dennis Collins. Few people saw him lash out at supporters afterwards. Billy Pickin hit the deck. And again. 
halfway. Well, it bounce okay for Pickett. No, oh, down he goes for Matthews. And when he bumps it, they stay down. Now, Wearmouth going at eyes. Oh, Wearmouth cocked it. He's got to get a free kick for that. Let me put his head out of the suck of the game. Or trying to get away from Scott, but he's And Rayburn, to too. Anyway. Fabulous Phil yeah, took on Carlton and escaped without penalty. I don't know whether it's Carlton or Lever. I do. It could have been Dool doing. But it could be another bloke coming in now. This fellow here. Look at this. Well, the umpire did take Carlton's number. Although it's he still is. on again here now. They're still having a go. For a short pass. It's not a good one. But Rene Kink and right. David Mackay. Rene Kink. A free kick to Carlton. But he backs up while he gets it clear. But it's a hurried kick down there. It's a free kick. Carmen and Cotogio. There's the play on Pickham there. and it's McClure. It's over beautifully to Collins. And Collins, Collins went down. Oh, he's got one in the face. He got a free kick. He certainly scoots around. Percy Jones side. stuck his arm out and Max Richardson ran into it. Melrose gathers the ball oh. in the centre. Lethal Lee and oh, Graham Melrose. Moncree picks up. Oh, Hawthorne, he got Mike Moncree. There. Packers Keenan yeah, dropped two weeks for belting Don Scott and missed out on the grand it final. It. it appears that way. Don Scott. Kick, but not paid by the umpire. Now is suddenly Carmen kicked. again He's with Carlton. Daryl Sutton. Oh, uh, Oborn and Bright. There's the up there. Look at them all going in. Flat out here. Look at Burns. They're all into it. Could be dangerous. Uh, Ronnie Wimmer yeah, bumped into I'm Steve McCann. And see. then Keith Gregg. Uh, oh, and the crunch of the 1978 so finals. And Doug Harry Smith and Kevin Worthington hard. as they collided. And the Magpies are really going in hard. He hasn't moved. Smith With play like this, Malcolm Blight won North Melbourne's third Brownlow medal in six years. He became the first South Australian ever to win Victorian football's highest honour. Whether it was in the air or on the ground, or shooting for goal from seemingly impossible positions, Blight was sheer magic. It was an embarrassing win. In the days leading up to the count, it was whispered that Blight had won from Peter Knights and the red-hot favourite Gary Wilson. It was a rumour that turned out to be spot on. But who cared? Round no medals are only won by champion. Right, a hand pass back to Blight. Let's see what he can do with his left foot again for exactly the same position. He tries to kick it through. What's he done? Piggy hands. In 1979, the theme song for Seven's Big League sold 210,000 records and became the football anthem of a nation. National night football, football competition the began in March at VFL Park, introducing Western Australia, New South Wales and Canberra. It meant tribunals at night and Graham Teasdale was first up. He got off. Mal Lamouth came back to town. This time he was fighting umpires instead of players. They were victorious and that was all that mattered to him. But to run around running, I'm not allowed to talk to you. It's like that little kid that lost his football and was sent home, you know, took it home. Well, we might see you up here on Monday night. You, you won't be back. seeing me. I'm not. I'm going home now. They can please and bloody sell what they do. We'll have a radio link up or something. They can suit themselves. Uh, when Hawthorne dear. played Claremont, VFL Park sprang yeah. a leak. It, it was no oasis for the Sand Grovers. Their winning streak was cool, lose, and they so, lost uh, by a kick. Somebody's, uh, you know, on the Victorian side for sure. Uh, we see Peter Moore and still at VFL Park, change. Collingwood's That's Peter Moore was too. forced to make running adjustments to the crowd's delight. An angry elephant ran a market Arden Street, proving you hadn't seen anything in a football match until you'd been to North Melbourne. Oh, 
and the busiest mouth in league football just couldn't resist having his say. There. there was a little bit of an altercation. Bounces right, he's got a chance to snap Sunday football finally came to Melbourne and it'll was televised live by seven. In this Commodore Cup match, an aging star found the goalpost easier to kick than the ball. Gully Percy had the chance to get back in the side and you mulled it, mate. Richmond captain Kevin Bartlett had to travel all the way to Sydney to play his 311th game and break Jack Dyer's long-standing club record. It was one of two league games played in Sydney and televised live to huge audiences in Melbourne by seven. Fitzroy's rise as a power was the success story of the year. At VFL Park, they massacred Melbourne, kicking a VFL record of 36-22, 238 to Melbourne's 6-12-48. It was the biggest score and most mammoth win ever. What's the full forward zone? Big when North Melbourne met Carlton in May, neither side had been beaten. In one of the finest football matches for years, North snatched the game with the last kick of the match. He's only about, uh, what, uh, 20 metres out from goal directly in front. And look at those elated count players. Look at Jonesy. It'll be enough, I reckon, to win the game. The kick, it's swimming out of the market. It's a market for Denny. Boyce found Van Denny, and the ruse undefeated run continued. For exactly one week, Fitzroy cleaned them up at Arden Street. Can he put it through? He fires. I think he has. Goes for a pass up That loss hurt Alex Jesselinko's pride. The Carlton captain was to get more severe jolts. This time, it's Collingwood's Stan Magro. Well, Magro got him a beauty. I'm sure it was accidental, but it was a very, very solid hip and shoulder bump. Boots it over the centre half forward position. Looking no full forward topped the ton in 1979, but the season unearthed two potential champions. Michael Roach at Richmond kicked 90 goals and stamped himself as one of the most thrilling finds of the 70s. ...by Williams showing plenty of strength. Boots it well over the half forward line. Roach at the back position. Can he oh. mark? He's got it. Great. He's only had three kicks, Roach, but he's got three <laughs> goals. Now he's got four. That's another one. Oh, Michael Roach. Very happy about that. The booking for Terry Danaher has been a kick five goal to leave. Get the mark, Terry Danaher. Terry Danner showed how South Melbourne had erred in clearing him by dominating the Essendon forward line until a broken jaw put him out of action. Going in after this Terry Danner who turns on the left foot, steadies up on the right, bang straight towards the goals and I think he's put it through. It was one of the highest scoring years in league history. Carlton topped the century mark a record 21 times. These were the goals of the season. He gets a hand pass working to Jennings. Jennings in trouble also but breaks away with pace Jennings 15 20 meters out from goal Jennings runs into the open goal towards the goal square up high was Moncrief has knocked it down he'll kick it over the shoulder and Moncrief having a field day has brought up his sixth goal the wing Robbie Flower up high hooks it down goes on again knocks it back over the top magnificent football by Flower it's Robbie Flower in full flight oh. Hand pass, looking for Matthews, Sutton hot on his hammer. Lee Matthews looking for someone to give it to, there's no one there. Matthews will have to go around himself, he goes around three players. Oh, Lines up the goal, beautiful play! Yeah, full forward zone, it's tapped across towards Clement and McMahon. Clement seems to have recovered from that knock that he got earlier. Has a shot at the goals from the boundary line, look at that! A little bit higher from uh, Reigns that time, a little bit of weight being used in the match now. Here's Harms firing at goals from 30 metres out. That answers everything, four points. He recovers it pretty well. Back it goes to Fitzpatrick, a left foot snap for goal. It's going pretty close. And it's coming around beautifully. What a beautiful goal. Manassa leads in the race for the ball. Manassa out wide on the half forward flank. Able to break a brilliant piece of football by Manassa. He straightens up. It could even be a goal if it makes a distance. I think it's just been touched by Francis Burke. No. no. For a big fellow, can't find Joe. The ball forced forward again for South Melbourne. Out of bounds. I feel now it's a goal. It was a decade for the mighty leap and the majestic mark. And these were the outstanding marks of 1979. Kicking up toward the full forward zone. Edwards trying to force his way through. Rush! Robin moving down there up towards Wells. Oh, beautiful. Fishing looks down there for Banks. Up high. Getting better luck next time. Great mark Right up towards the half forward flank. Oh, getting up Tens of thousands of dollars in media awards were shared by two men in 1979. 
And on September 24th, both Gary Wilson and Gary Dempsey sat in expectation at the Southern Cross as the Brownlow medal votes were counted. Peter Moore, the winner of the 1979 Brownlow medal. Tonight is the greatest thrill I've ever had in my football life and my life, you know, anyway. But um, the, the name of the game in football is, is to win premierships. And uh, unfortunately we didn't do it in 77 and Collingwood and the Collingwood supporters um, have been waiting for 21 or 22 years mm. for a premiership. And to me, although this is wonderful and I, you know, I'm really honoured to receive it, I think that um, I'll just be forgetting about it and get out on Saturday and try and get best on the ground on Saturday. Oh.